Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. My name is Alexandra McLeod. I'm the head of branded programming at Women as One. I'm thrilled to be here with you guys today to launch the Women as One Leadership Academy with a virtual screening of presentations that pop. This video is the first in a series of four videos that, inter that feature interviews from global women leaders on key leadership topics. In addition to today's event, I hope you'll also join us for the screenings of our three additional videos. If it doesn't exist, build it. Next generation considerations and industry relationships, what's important. For more information on our future events, you can visit our website, womenisone.org. Today's event will feature a screening of the video followed by a moderated panel discussion and audience Q&A. Please be sure to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen um, it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask your questions. Um, please use the Q&A instead of the chat if possible. Um, and now I'd like to introduce the participants in today's events. Um, our moderator is Dr. Allison Bailey. She's the Affiliated Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Tennessee. And our panelists, Dr. Daniel Armbinder, the co-founder of the Cardio Nerds podcast and a cardiology fellow at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Karen Sliwa, Director of the Hatter Institute for Cardiovascular Research in Africa, and the 2019-2020 World Heart Federation President, and Sally Vincent, CEO of Europa Group. Thank you all for joining us today and for participating in this event. And now, without further ado, I am very pleased to share with you the video of Presentations That Pop. There have been a lot of webinars lately. <laughs> it has been death by Zoom, but I think it was a really interesting opportunity to watch pe different people present. The really brilliant speaker, they remain um, authentic, so they remain themselves. The most engaging speaker I've seen was one where he really addressed the audience when he was speaking. Um, you know, you could tell that he was very familiar with his topic. He knew it in and out. And so when he spoke, it was like he was just speaking to you. The lectures I actually have and best memories are those where the person brings him or herself into the lecture. I actually quite like imperfection, um, which doesn't mean I like sloppy, unprepared presentations, but I hate losing the, 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 the real person in there to something that's extremely smooth and structured and perfectly run. One that I remember so well, this amazing endocrinologist, she had a story. You see, that was the difference. Everyone else appeared to be presenting data but she actually told a story that had a flow. First thing is, I think about whom I'm going to give the lecture to, because I pitch the levels how I present what I want to talk is to my audience. It's a big difference if it's a purely scientific community or if it's a lay, mixed with lay people if it's your own discipline or if it's a broader medical group. So it's very important to think to who you are speaking to. Not adapting to the audience for me is the number one flop I see happening basically. Every talk should be tailored to that audience. And I, and I mean um, characteristics of that audience in terms of their expertise levels, um, as well as language and cultural norms. For example, there are talks that I give that have to be interpreted in another language. And so I realize I need to budget more time for those. Um, speak in shorter sentences because they may or may not need to be interpreted either actually by a translator or in that person's head. When I start making a presentation, I usually jot down on paper what are the key take-homes. In many ways, I'm starting out with the conclusions of the talk. 
I like being on subject matter that I'm more comfortable with. I will basically mind map out the presentation on paper, then start building it into slides. I think one of the biggest mistakes is to pack too many slides together in a talk. That was clearly a mistake I used to make a lot when I was uh, a lot younger. For a 10 minute talk, I would sometimes have 24 slides, which was entirely too many. When you plan a lecture, less is always more. For how I plan my lecture is that I plan one slide per minute. So if I have 20 minutes to present my data, I don't have more than 20 slides. If I only have 10 minutes, I have 10 slides. I try to make sure that the whole story has a flow and then the slides come in according to that storyline and the papers come in to support that storyline. Now, this is something I've, again, done fairly recently. Uh, when I was younger, it was a very different approach that I took. Intuitively, when one is new, one wants to put all the sentences, all the context there, because you are worried you're forgetting something. So it's a skill one has to practice with time. And you will see that most experienced speakers have less and less and less text on their slides. I like my slides to be simple. If a picture is the best way to convey the message, just put that picture on the slide, don't put any text. You can be the text, you can speak through what that picture or that graphic means. If I have a slide with text on it, I follow the seven by seven rule. No more than seven words per line, no more than seven lines per slide. Those slides are really my prompts almost. Very basic and down to, you know, words, images sometimes if they're appropriate, but really very, fairly skimpy presentations really in regards to the slides. If you have too much on the slide, someone's actually trying to spend time digesting what you have on the slide, which detracts from their attention to you. So use yourself as a way to really be able to convey the information on the slide, but keep the slides very, very simple. One thing I would caution against is using too much animation in a good presentation. This is a, a mistake we often make because we think of animation as a tool to help you be able to carry the audience with you. But I would say that the content should really speak for yourself and the delivery should really help you carry from one area to the next. I actually always use black text on white. I'm never using blue and yellows and pinks and reds and greens. When I listen to lecture, I prefer less um, colorful and dramatic um, animations because it distracts me actually from the content. Sometimes when you hear yourself speak, as opposed to think about what you're going to say, you hear something that uh, you didn't appreciate just thinking through your slide content. So I think that that's really, really important. I will literally be in my lounge room with what I use as the microphone, which is going to be the remote control of the television, pushing on my chin as in a real circumstance. And I'll have the timer on my slide set and I'll be going through it. It's important that you practice the lecture while you are standing. Your voice is different when you stand. Ideally, in front of a mirror, you, you put your laptop in front that the mirror is also there and you can see yourself lifting your chin, projecting yourself to the audience, and then you, 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 you read through your content. And I, I really would recommend if you are not doing that frequently, you have to practice your lecture four or five times to make sure you are in your time timelines. Exceeding one's allotted time during a presentation is a no-no. <laughs> I have three levels of practice. If it's a really short presentation, that is what I call Mary had a little lamb type practice, which means I script it and memorize it and practice it to the extent that I can go, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, Mary had a little lamb. I could, my brain could be turned off. I could be just smiling and I could still sprout the whole thing. The second level, I have scripted main points in each slide. I know exactly what I'm going to say and how I'm going to begin each slide and how I'm going to link from that slide to the next. 
So I have memorized the order of my slides always because that's the only way you can link. You, you can't see the next slide, but you got to link the story so that the next slide doesn't come like, huh? It's like, oh, it's part of the story. And then level three preparation is sort of the relaxed one. And, and the relaxed one would be something, for example, I prepared and delivered already 10 times or something, you know. Um, and I just want to give it in a new way to speak to the current audience better. But I know the data down pat. It's just I want to nuance it to fit the audience better. And for that, I always, always prepare my opening line. Because I feel that once you started on the right foot, you kind of gain confidence. We're now in an age where we're listening to things all the time, whether it's something we're seeing visually face to face or or virtually or listening to podcasts. So we've we've all honed our ears to really hear someone who can speak well. And so I think, you know, making sure you've got great organization as well as a, um, you know, a, a delivery that makes it very engaging, I think is critical good to a good presentation. I'll simplify it to the three S's, the, the, the story, the slides, the speaker mode. When you give a lecture, it's, it's important that you walk up, you look in your audience, you connect with your audience, you take a deep breath before you start to speak. It's particularly important for women who are often, when they are stressed, get a more high pitched voice. So if you start speaking under stress, your voice becomes higher and you sound stressed and your message is not coming across well. So simply by practicing to walk, look in the audience, taking the deep breath, saying good day, looking again, and then starting to talk, it makes a big difference on the impression, your, the content of your presentation it's making to the audience. When people are nervous, and I was quite nervous when I first started speaking, we talk faster. But uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the audience listens faster. I'm a nervous speaker to start out with. When I was a fellow, I used to beg my clinical preceptor for a beta blocker just to help me get over that anxiety. I used to be extremely nervous when I was a junior cardiology trainee and researcher and I had to present my first time my data at the American Heart Association meeting. I was extremely nervous. I had a lot of text on my slides. I virtually read my entire slide. I never looked up. We have a training program here at Duke where all of our fellows, when they're delivering their first few talks, We'll also deliver this in front of a group of many other fellows and faculty. And I think this is really important. Um, we actually even video record the first few presentations so you can actually look at yourself as you're presenting. It's the most uncomfortable thing in the world to do, uh, but it's quite effective. I suppose the only thing I know how to, to, to do facing nerves is breathe. It sounds silly and basic, but that's really the most efficient way of doing things. I do still get nervous. Every talk, uh, if you tested my heart rate, it's always going to be above 100. This is just something that, um, you know, you, you get used to after a while. The more confident you are about what you're about to say, the less the nerves bother you. The go-to, breathe. When you're about to go on or it's a it's a big deal, you've, you've rehearsed already and you just can feel your heart pounding. Um, you know, I, I, I really breathe. I'll often remember things about or, or revisualize a great presentation that I've done or revisualize how much pleasure you do get out of it. Because even if the nerves are there, usually when you get rolling, there's pleasure in it. I hope everyone enjoyed watching that video. Um, just a quick note, I, I realize the audio might have cut out there a little bit. Um, this video and all of these sessions will be recorded and um, archived on the Women is One website. So we encourage you to log into the talent directory. You can revisit this video as many times as you'd like. Um, and hopefully you'll hear any pieces that you might have missed. 
Um, I'd now like to turn it over to our moderator, Allison Bailey. She is going to lead our panelists here in a panel discussion, and then we will open it up to Q&A from, from our audience. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I know I learned a lot of tips and I'm sure you guys did as well. I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists, what is your one must do for a presentation? I know you've all done them in, in different arenas. Um, Karen, maybe we could start with you. You're actually on mute. Karen, you're on mute. I'm mute now? Yes. First, I want to apologize. I, want, I might cut off. We have a massive storm here, and therefore my internet might be unstable, but there's not much I can do. There is a massive wind, yes. So um, I, I presented already how I prepare my, my presentation, but I think the most important aspect is really to think who's your audience, whom you want to reach, and not going over time. I think one is, I find most people find it really annoying to either if someone goes over time or rushes a lot in the end, you actually forget almost the rest of the entire presentation if someone doesn't finish in time or even worse, the chairperson cuts the speaker short. So I really would recommend to not have too many slides and plan to finish something like 20 seconds before. Um, so less is really more. I think that's great advice. And it also makes it much easier for your chairs or moderators if you're watching your own time. Sally, how about mm. you? Do you have a one must takeaway? Well, to add to what uh, Karen has just suggested, I suppose I would come back to practicing. You know, I don't know many people who can deliver a really good presentation without practice. And the more that's going to be the contrary of less is more, it's more is more. Um, you know, the more you get comfortable with it, then the more you can play around with it and bounce back and adjust to your audience and adapt to what they're asking. So when you're comfortable, you know, things get a lot easier and it's more... It's, 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 you know, it's a better quality delivery for the audience as well. So they get more out of it. That's great advice. And then Dan, I certainly don't want to leave you out. What kind of tips do you have for your one must for your presentations? So thank you very much. And again, thank you for having me. And uh, on behalf of the Carter Nerds, we're just uh, very excited to be part of this. But uh, a must for, for visual presentations is planning it's just so essential uh have a plan of how you're going to take your audience from the beginning to the end and having the slide deck itself is not the plan the plan is in your mind and if you have the plan then you are going to be able to really walk the audience through everything that they need to know and prepare them before they need to know it then let them know what they need to know and then tell them what they've learned and you'll be able to have a successful um, part of it. And then obviously uh, practice is, is essential. And that is, uh, for, for me, it's a verbal, actual practice. I'm, I'm speaking it out. And if I find that I'm boring myself, then I start again and basically make it exciting for me to hear my own voice explain the concepts that I want to explain. And then when you feel excited and you feel like you've got it right, that's probably when you're ready to give the presentation to others. Okay, that's great. Um, how about, I'm gonna take a question from the audience here, but how about when you're presenting via Zoom or some sort of online platform versus an in-person uh, presentation? Do you have specific things that you do differently for that? Sally, maybe you could start with this one for us. Um, well, I have to say that since uh, March of this year, we have been doing a lot of that. So one of the rules that we put in place very early was that whether it was the same team coming on board, we just remind everybody of the rules that we all needed to put in place to make it um, functional and efficient. So we'd come back to the basics about, you know, raising hands with the system, uh, pushing questions through, giving time to everybody, doing a round table at the end to add thing, make sure that we'd covered every topic and every person. But 
you know, there is an advantage to it in some respects is that you actually have a good visual of people. And if you're not, you know, doing 20 plus people around the table, um, you've got up to a dozen, you can actually capture quite a bit. You haven't got the the full body language, but you can see when someone has a question, um, it's a little different to a big audience, but mm -hmm. we found it to be, we, we actually got used to it fairly quickly, I have to say. Okay, great advice. And then Dan, how about you? Any specific tips that you think about for an online presentation versus in person? Yeah, so in person, you know, uh, well, I think the general gist is you have to limit the, the uh, distractions and basically get at the core message that you want to teach. As we talked, you know, we alluded to earlier in, in this uh, phenomenal presentation, you know, sometimes animations overdo it. I definitely uh, discovered GIFs and uh, went way overboard initially, but uh, <laughs> definitely scaled back and learned how to really edit it down. And that's very, very helpful live. And when you're live in front of, of people, you, you're dealing with, situ you know, your body language is more relevant. I mean, obviously you have some body language that you have to deal with and people walking behind you, uh, case in point. But, um, but the, the, the key is limit the distractions so the audience can engage in what they actually want to take out of the, the talk. So whether it's in person and it's your hand motions or whether it's uh, on a Zoom call and connectivity issues, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Again, great advice. And I know one of the things I find for myself is if I were away at a meeting, I schedule time away. But sometimes when I'm doing a Zoom presentation or other things, I may have the events of the day still going on in the background. So I agree, removing those distractions for both the audience and the presenter is very helpful. And then Karen, do you have takeaways about Zoom uh, presentations? Yes, absolutely. I think you can see a, a good example. The, the recording happened in my office and it was a big screen and I think the, the light was correct. And I had elevated because I do so many Zoom calls. So you see you, you elevated that you are straight in your screen. Now I'm at, I had to go home for a certain reason. I can't be in the office. So obviously this is a laptop and I have nothing to put under my laptop. So the angle is not great. You can see I have a big window here. So the light is coming from the side and it's actually much better if you have, like you saw in the video, the light coming from a certain angle because it's not great if you can't see the contours of the face well. I mean, we are used to look in someone's face and you want to see the face properly. So the light source also, and Daniel is not perfect, the window is too big. <laughs> so. So that's very different. Usually when we give a lecture at the Congress, we don't even think, we don't think about the light, we don't think about the microphone, we don't think about someone might walk behind you. Um, that's all things so the technical team is doing. Suddenly we have the job to be the speaker and the technical team, which is a big difference. So I think for, for important, uh, lectures where you, let's say, you go for a job interview or uh, it's a keynote lecture which is on Zoom. I really think you need to think very carefully about your environment or might have to borrow in someone else's office or computer and practice it. Uh, otherwise, you, you spoil a very good presentation. Again, great advice. And I think none of us have thought about our surroundings as much as we have during this Zoom world. Um, so talking about now moving on to uh, not having video. So in Zoom meetings or WebExes, we can see each other and, and play off of those hand motions or when someone wants to say anything. How do you prepare if it's audio only or you don't see your other speakers or maybe a podcast presentation? Dan, I may let you take this one first because I know you do a lot of podcasting. Oh, sure. Uh, definitely. We'll give a crack at it. So, you know, humans are really visual people. In fact, uh, we've learned, uh, um, you know, my co-founder and I, Ahmed, have learned, like, when you want to have a good meeting with somebody, it actually pays to do it on Zoom or do it on whatever, whatever platform, uh, because just there's, there's, it's so valuable to look at your audience's face and get that interact. not audience, sorry, the meeting participant that you have, you know, that you could really understand if you're going in the right direction with them and you could pivot very quickly and make a, uh, what would have been a catastrophe into a phenomenal success. That's what it comes to the visual. And so it's the same thing, you know, most of what is taught in, especially in cardiovascular medicine is taught with PowerPoints and taught with videos and taught with um, diagrams. 
And so when you leap into the audio only space, you kind of are setting yourself up for a, uh, a challenge. But the challenge is also the basically the reward because and the solution because you know you have the ability to draw your audience into a story. And it's all about storytelling, whether it's a PowerPoint presentation, but so is a podcast. It's storytelling. And it could be a story about a patient and very vivid. You know, we're in the hospital, there's beeps. You can you can basically create that environment and utilize the audience imagination to do their own vivid imagery. But you can also do it with technical subjects that you would never have thought by using analogies. Like for example, um, if you're talking about uh, aortic stenosis, you can think about a soda bottle and poke a little hole in the cap and see if you could try to squeeze out of that soda bottle. And now you're all thinking about soda bottles, diet of course. Uh, but basically, you know, that is a way that you have the ability to harness the imagery and imagination of your audience and that is definitely a very big part of podcasting and creating audio, um, audio only. I could definitely go on about this topic forever, but I'll, uh, I'll let, let other people uh, weigh in. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Sally, how about you? When you're doing audio only presentations or conferences, what tips can you give us for that? Well, I have to say I'm not a podcaster as uh, Daniel is, but um, just listening to him was interesting. I'm, you know, have started to, to, to hook into podcasts myself. France is always about 10 years behind the US, so I'm a bit slow to take them up. But I have noticed that, you know, I'm not a big one for listening to them when I'm cooking. I actually like listening to them with my headphones on and my eyes closed. So I, I will fall into it really easily and be captured quite easily, but I like to be in a, in, in in a sort of um, an isolated space to get the most out of it. And, and you realize and you measure how important the voice is and how much you create from that voice, you create a whole atmosphere and, and you complete it with your images and, uh, and things. But it certainly is a, a, a powerful tool. Wonderful. Karen, do you have any advice for audio only presentations where you don't get to see your uh, constituents? Um. I avoid to do that. I simply don't like it, but I obviously give up interviews for radios or look, uh, I do that. But I want to add, raise something else about voice. So uh, two, two things. I, amongst you, I'm uh, obviously not born English speaking and I have a German accent. And I think amongst the listeners or participants, there will clearly be some the English is not the mother language. And it is quite a problem um, because focus so much on the English that you actually don't focus enough on what you really want to say. And I really want to encourage people that it really doesn't matter if you have an accent or one or a few words are wrong because it's a medium and it really is okay if it's not perfect and you just better get rid of your complex and move on. So that's the tip number one to language. The second one is for female speakers and the tone of the voice. If you look at, at the most women who made it really high up in the career ladder, just watch their voices. I have, I'm not aware of voice. And we all can train our voice, you know that. Even a soprano singer can think relatively deep. And it is, I, for instance, attended a voice clinic because I was such a bad speaker. It was such an issue for me to speak in public. I actually did a voice clinic course and a public speaking course, actually three. There was no way I could speak in public otherwise. And they, they teach you, there are breathing techniques there are ways how you, when you start speaking, you speak a bit lower toned. And I really would recommend for spe a female speaker who speak on a very high tone to think about their voice. It is, there are studies, I'm not, you, if you look it up, you will see there are lots of studies that most human beings find it not pleasant to, li to listen for a long time to a very high pitched voice. And it, is, it can be detrimental if you want to move up in a corporate business or whatever, if it's really important for you to, to worthwhile 
to think about the tone of your voice and to adapt your voice slightly. I think that's great advice. I also think it's wonderful advice to talk about if you stumble just a little bit to keep going. We all make mistakes and, and not yes. let that ruin the cadence or the flow of the conversation. And we all sound different. Obviously, I, I've got a Southern accent and sound different than everyone else on the call. But I think just accepting our differences is one of the great parts about these presentations. Mm. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to take an audience question now. And one of these questions are, do you bring notes to your talks? And if so, is it a brief outline or is it really detailed sort of what you're going to say verbatim? Uh, Karen, you want to start with this one? Yeah, no, I don't do notes. I don't even do speaker notes. I never did speaker notes in my life. Um, so I do not I live with my imperfection, always did. <laughs> Sally, how about you? No, I'm not a note person either. I believe that, you know, my prompts are on the slides if I have a slide set. Um, and that's all I need because I've, you know, I know the material and I have practiced. And usually if it's not that, it's more an interview format. So no, notes really only confuse me and get uncomfortable in my hands. So not for me. <laughs> okay. And I imagine this may change as you become more familiar with your content and throughout your career. Dan, how about you? Do you use notes? Yeah, so actually I, uh, the way I build my PowerPoints from uh, for the PowerPoint stuff is I actually put like too much words in initially on purpose. And that's my crutch as I actually start to learn the material. But by the time the audience sees it, it's all out actually. And what I've learned is that um, sticking with the script is good um, when it's in your head. But when the script is on the paper, it, uh, it comes out very, it, it, you know, it comes out very scripted and you're it's, it's a little hard to pivot and, you know, change your nuance and cadence is a little bit off. So what I end up doing is actually like, as we talked about earlier, like really limiting it to a couple words, but because I had learned the material and learned my presentation in the longer form, I'm able to supplement all the words that are no longer on the PowerPoint. So it's cleaner and it's less scripted. And I do this for the same with the podcast as well. Like when we're interviewing um, experts in the field as, 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 as such as yourself and, and like you do on your show, um, you know, you, you have to have a plan. You have to have, you're, you're almost presenting to them in a way, because you want to extract the best out of what they're going to give you. And so you have to come with a script, but if you're too scripted, it, it, you, you, uh, you really aren't talking to them. You're talking out the, at them. So I have a bullet point of like, we need to accomplish X in the next question. And that's what I have bolded there. And then basically I ad lib off of that. But again, like I've had the script in my mind. It's just not on the paper. I think that's great advice. I love the fact that you start with more words and remove them. That's actually one of the tools that I use too, especially if it's a newer information I'm presenting. Uh, and I think this plays really well into another uh, viewer or uh, listener question. If your area of expertise is different from that of your audience, do you acknowledge that you're not an expert, but rather an, uh, maybe not an expert in that field, but rather a different one? Or do you think that weakens the audience's perception of you? Dan alluded this to, to this a little bit when you're ho hosting a podcast or a show where you're inviting other guests. How about if you're given a presentation? Sally, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I do. I don't like to, you know, fake it till I make it sort of thing. So if I'm not an expert, but they've asked me to talk about something, then either I'll sort of get organized before going on and, and, and learn their expectations and understand why I've been asked. It happened recently for a, a, a glass ceiling women in business type of thing. And I said, listen, I'm really not your person. But when we spoke about it, we found another angle that made sense to me. So I won't be going on board and talking about something um, as an expert if it's not my, you know, if it's not something I feel I have stuff to share on. Absolutely not. Erin, how about you? What, what I do, I basically, with two sentences, introduce myself. I'm saying I'm a, I'm a clinical scientist or a cardiologist working there. So it's a logic sequence that I'm not exactly the expertise of the meeting I might have been invited. Let's say I'm at a lipidology conference. I introduce myself as a cardiologist and then everyone knows that I'm not exactly in the field, but I'm not saying I'm not the expert. I would never say that. 
That's very fair. And then Dan, I think you know, you've already talked about this for your podcast, but how about if you were given a talk, especially as someone who's still pretty new in the world of cardiology? Yeah, definitely. This happens all the time. I'm an interventional fellow and I have to go and present uh, thing, you know, in front of my interventional attendings and they obviously know way more about what I'm about to present. But I think the key is to show that you care. I mean, you, if you prepared uh, enough to say that I, I can speak your language and I can connect with you on your language, you know, it, it depends on, again, on the setting, but if it's a more of an intimate setting, you ask the audience or you ask the experts to compliment the talk. Uh, not, and I don't mean by that kind of compliment, um, but basically enhance the talk by contributing their own experiences to it. And you say, you know, it's okay to say, you know, definitely I've, my years of training are X, so there's no way that I could really have a full grasp of this concept, but I gave it a shot and here's how I conceptualize it. And the other thing is, um, and this goes with all kinds of teaching, you know, anybody can make a topic their own. You know, you could be a, a new person to the topic, but the way you think about it and the way mm. you want to articulate it, because mm. you could really, really make, make it very personalized, even if you're being exposed to it for the first time. You could say, you know, I had, I just, it took me a very long time to get this, but finally I got it with this analogy. You know what I mean? Or I, I went and talked to that person and they were able to explain it to me. And this is how they explained it to me. And so those are different tips and tricks that I use um, to basically keep the audience engaged, but at the same time, disclaim the fact that, you know, your experience is limited in this subject. Great tips. All right, I'm going to go back to one more uh, Zoom presentation or online presentation question because I think this comes up a lot. Do you use any devices to help with lighting? For instance, my office is really dark. So I do use a, a, a light. I use one of these loom lights. There's lots of different ones out there. I'll throw it back to you guys. Sally, do you use any lighting? No, but um, I have done it for registration or, you know, recording such as we did for this one. And, you know, the result is different. So I think it comes back to what Karen was saying earlier, you know, your surroundings are important and it does make a difference to the final outcome. So for internal meetings and things, you know, we're Zooming from morning till night at the moment. So the everyday stuff, no, but for, you know, a bigger audience or something if it's external to the company or if we're having a, a, a sort of an online seminar with a, a, a big number of our employees, then yes, it's worth that extra mile to get a great result coming through. Dan, how about you? You use any lighting or any tips? Yeah, so uh, because of, uh, I, I should say it, we just had our uh, fifth child and I'm an interventional fellow and we're doing Carter Nerd, so I'm really all over the place and I, I just don't have an office of my own right now. But um, but I will say that uh, my partner, Amit, uh, you know, ha once we went into Zoom mode, uh, he has, you know, decorated out his room to really um, be very helpful. And, and it's a, a few de decorations that are in the background actually uh, really soothe the background. And you can see, uh, obviously here, this light is, is awful. The window is awful. Like, you, you know, if I was having a real sit down uh, conversation where I was trying, and we are here now. Not to say, but if I was like really, really, really trying, I dress to impress, and I would do the lighting. Um, I would try to get everything right. And the thing is, um, you know, with podcasting, it's the same exact thing. You know, we are so careful about every sound, every distraction. And you know, I we I, we bought uh, microphones, and um, you know, basically, I, I was, let's say for example, the P sound on a microphone is uh, it could be annoying to people, and so. The, you know, we invested a little bit more and got these pop filters that remove that P sound. So, you know, it, it actually makes a very big difference. And when we shipped it, when we shopped around our first couple of episodes to people, um, we didn't have some of these extra changes and um, the feedback that we got when we shopped them, when we, when we did the same episode, but kind of redid it with their feedback and gave it back to them was like the audio quality makes it so much more easier to pay attention to the content. And so um, everything does matter. And as we said earlier, um, that like you're now your studio technician, you're also your, you know, your, your, uh, your, besides for the actual content, it really does matter. So I, I definitely agree with everything that everyone has said. Let me ask you one other question since you do a lot of audio formats. Do you use a separate microphone or do you use your AirPods? I see you have some, some of those then. Oh, yeah, yeah. So actually, um, uh, uh, I use a Yeti. Uh, they're not that expensive, less than $100. Uh, that's my the microphone that I use. My partner Amit does as well. Um, 
there are other microphones that are very affordable on Amazon that or anywhere. I don't want to endorse any particular conglomerate, but uh, that people can use that are very good. We have done um, over the last like uh, uh, three months, we've done a, a, a Cardinard's case report series where we basically like offered every fellowship program in the country to come on the show. And so we were able to basically interview uh, just hundreds of people in the last couple of months. Uh, and they use all sorts of microphones. AirPods actually are, but even the, the uh, Apple microphones that plug in or uh, they, they seem to really work. And the key is, uh, the microphone is very helpful, but the key is also to um, have your guests make sure that they're not tapping on the table or doing something or shuffling papers. Those things can be very distracting. But in general, um, uh, sound check is very helpful and there are different ways to do it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good feedback. And then Karen, do you have anything to add about this lighting issue? I know you talked about it just a little bit earlier. No, I just hate headphones. You never will see me with headphones. <laughs> I just don't like the feeling in the ear while I talk that something is plugged in there. So <laughs> that's what I never use. As I said, the light, I make sure, I make sure the sound is okay. But headphones, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Um, I'm going to take another audience question. And so the question is, I've seen many speakers give talks that are unnecessarily complicated, all those Western blots. And the audience leaves the room impressed, but not really learning anything. On the other hand, and talks that seem very simple can make the speaker be perceived as less confident slash not maybe an expert. Have you seen that and any advice on how to deal with this? I think gender bias may play a role here, uh, but would like to hear what your thoughts are. Karen, would you like to start on this one? Yes, uh, there is a very easy solution to that. You start very slow and simple so that the entire audience can follow you. And then you go into with the last slides, you go really in all your notes. And if, they, if, if you lose some, it's okay. It's not the area of expertise. But, um, and that's usually, but, but you need to get the audience from the beginning to at least understand what, you're, what you want to talk about. And then the last slide might be simple again, because even if you lost someone in the middle with very detailed lab analysis or whatever your topic is, the conclusion must be simple enough that someone who's not in the field still understands the most important method. I think that's great advice. So you sort of build a foundation and then bring your listener in as you get into more complicated topics. Mm -hmm. Sally, what kind of tips do you have in this area? Well, as a professional Congress organizer, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about these sorts of things. And I was listening to Daniel with interest earlier. Um, you know, what I like to see in a conference is actually different levels of knowledge coming through. It's great having, you know, the world expert talk about a top down thing that's really essential. He's the number one person or she is that knows the topic extremely well and can condense it in, in a fabulous way and deliver the message message. But it's also sometimes great to hear from younger um, mm. practitioners, you know, fellows and see their take on things. And, um, you, you know, when you see the interaction with some of the uh, older generation experts and the younger ones, that's where all that sharing and that connection generates so much learning, you know, for both communities. I don't think it's necessarily unidirectional. I think there's learning to be had in all sorts of different levels. And sometimes, the most simple things are the most important, the same way sometimes we need to hear the simple stuff again, even later on when we know the subject well. So I don't think there's a one rule fits all. I think a good balance in a, in a conference, for example, is really important. Great. And then Dan, anything to add to, to that uh, question? Yes, and uh, the key, I, I agree with everything that we've said, and, and uh, we, we've learned this over time, and, uh, and definitely can, you, can, you can see the fruits of how it works out. So, uh, as, so as an example, you know, our audience spans from er very, very, very early learners to uh, Professor Emeritus uh, in the super selective uh, cardiomyopathy that deals with sarcoid when it's only on the lateral side of the heart, you know. So we have to basically meet them all and how to, and then at the, at the same time in the podcasting format, you know, your, your audience is on the move. They're at the grocery shop. They're multitasking. They're in the car. 
you know, they're doing all sorts of other activities. So how do you do this? How do you basically keep them engaged and, and also, you know, teach them? And how do you teach somebody that's been practicing for years and at the same time teach, um, you know, somebody who's just starting out? And so the way, the way we have thought about doing this is layers and immersion. And as we, as, uh, as we said just before, you know, really starting at the basic principles. Um, but, you know, going up in a linear progression but at the same time, recognizing that your audience might be picking out tomatoes. So if you have just a linear progression, your audience may have missed a, a key step, a key link. And so they will be lost for the rest of it and they may move on. What you have to do is keep cycling back to the foundational principles. And cardiology actually is perfect for it because the foundational principles, the, hemod the, the anatomical setup leads to a hemodynamic oh. consequence that you're basically seeing in physical exam, in echo, in the patient, what the patient's telling you, advanced imaging and treatments. Oh. And so you have that opportunity to keep cycling back to the basics. And so by the time you're done, you know, you basically have been able to take an early learner to stages of a late learner over time and reiterated it and create that immersive experience. At the same time, we've learned that you have to provide some expertise. When I go to watch uh, movies with my kids, you know, I find that I'm laughing at different parts and they laugh at different parts because the movie makers know that they can capture a bigger audience by having something for everybody to take out. And so that's what we do. And uh, uh, one of the structures that we're doing right now is we exactly what we had alluded to earlier. Sally, you mentioned this. We have the fellows present a case and discuss it. And we, we, we pretend we're sitting on a dock with our feet in the water and see how we basically would walk through this case. And at the end, we have an expert come on and basically do a bird's eye view recap and add their own teaching points. So at the end of the episode, everybody is at the same page. People have obviously gotten out different things, but it's a really immersive experience and they come out knowing a lot more than when they came in or having a refreshing insight on something that they already know, but now think about it in a little different way. Okay, great. Uh, now I'm gonna, we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I'm gonna bring up uh, one that's a little more challenging maybe. If, what happens if you get nervous? H how do you deal with that? And it probably could be from different uh, scenarios if it's maybe a very big presentation and you're nervous or maybe something doesn't go as planned on stage and, and it sort of rattles you just a little bit. Um, Karen, maybe you could start us off with this one. To be honest, I'm not nervous anymore, ever. I was so super nervous from my earlier career at some point, <laughs> it's just stopped. And look, it's not that I have you know, an issue. You know, I had, oh, I had all sorts of things. I once had to give a lecture in front of more than 1,000 people without slides because the slides were in the other room of the conference. The audio technical team swapped the presentations and I was, it was so great to see no one left. So I gave my entire lecture without slides and no one left the room. So afterwards I decided, why would I be nervous? It can't get worse in my life. And I'm actually not nervous anymore. You just move on. Even if you have no slides or you have shorter time or whatever, you, you just decide. It's a, it's a mental thing to decide also that even if it's not perfect, it will be fine. That's great. You just described one of my recurring nightmares. I show up somewhere and my slides aren't there. <laughs> Sally, how, <laughs> Sally, how about you? Do you have any issues with nerves or does that ever come into play anymore? Uh, depends really on the type of audience and the size of the audience, to be honest, but I won't get um, hustled and bustled by technical problems. And I think that comes from being a, a conference organizer. I know that it can happen at the best of times it happens. Um, and I know that there's a team somewhere running around madly trying to fix it. So I generally don't, you know, get, get sort of upset or, 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 or flabbergasted by that. Um, I think the, the really, my nightmare is that, you know, the audience you don't you don't connect with the audience um, and again that's probably why I do prepare a lot and will try and really understand who I'm speaking to what they're expecting and and put a lot of time into that to ensure that I don't go down that nasty nightmare road but uh, technical problems no that's going to be something I can deal with the rest is a little more complicated at times but you know I'll come back to one of the lessons that, that I mentioned earlier in the video is you know breathing just, you know, 
getting back into your breath and 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 then picking up and adjusting and and remembering that you know they're as human as I am and I've been in the audience and whatever so mm -hmm. things happen sometimes you just have to adjust right Dan how about you do you ever get nervous and what do you do to combat that yeah, if you guys could feel my palms now, they'd be ice cold. I am, uh, I'm nearly petrified to be here. But that kind of nervousness just lets me know that the audience is worth talking to, and uh, and I should be prepared with what I want to say. It's it's a it's a body sign that lets me know that I, I need to do something that's um, imp uh, that's important, give something that's important, and I, and basically it allows me to take what I'm doing seriously. If I wasn't nervous then uh, I probably am probably the wrong person for whatever I'm about to speak about. But uh, uh, Sally, I have to uh, just uh, re-emphasize re the breathing. I mean, it's just so essential. I, I'm, a, I'm a reasonable test taker, but sometimes the anxiety just can get really, really bad. And I remember for my step one boards, it was my first time uh, taking boards after a medical student. And I, I just was like, really, really, really wanted to do well and I really prepared and you know you know how you are everything you've done entire life builds upon this day and this day is going to be the most important day of my life and I came to the test and I and I was told by somebody like when you take a test sit forward and get get you know sympathetic activation get ready you know you're going to battle and uh, that actually was the bad idea for me the anxiety just got totally out of control I mean just totally out of control I couldn't think about anything and I just I just didn't know what to do I wanted to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't leave the test. And so I just sat back and I said, well, how do I practice studying? Well, I practice studying by sitting back in my chair and kicking back. And I take, I, st I study like this actually. And, uh, and I breathe. And so I started breathing and I calmed myself down and I was able to get to the test and did okay, did well actually. Uh, but then uh, it happened again, the next time I took step two. I had the same exact experience because again, it became like today is the biggest day of my life. Last time wasn't the biggest day of my life. And I had the same thing, but this time I was much quicker to catch myself. And so before I get ready to speak, before I get ready for these presentations, actually what I did today was I connected with the call and then I put my video off and I took a bunch of deep breaths. And uh, I know that the anxiety makes it harder for me to, to speak, but the reward, the endorphins that I get after I speak uh, are worth it. And so that basically is how I get through that. Great advice from all of you. I know when I speak, my hands get really sweaty. It doesn't matter how nervous or confident I am. So I'm always trying to minimize what I'm doing with my hands. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I think this has been such great information. I think the video was amazing. Um, I'll, I think we've got about five minutes left. So maybe I'll ask each of you if you just have one quick takeaway tip that you must tell people uh, that we haven't talked about yet. Sally, maybe you could start us with that as we close up. Well, it sort of comes uh, as a ensuite to what Daniel just said, but you know, there is pleasure in it. And uh, I think if you, you know, we, we, we can get nervous about it and it's sometimes very unsettling, but give it a try because it's actually a very growing process. And, uh, you know, Karen mentioned that she was extremely nervous younger and that she's never nervous anymore. So there's a real evolution in it and you grow into it. You learn about yourself, what reacts, what you react to. And uh, it gets you really capturing the audience and, and, and looking at what people are uh, asking for. And it's a, it's a great process. I think it's something that helps us uh, grow and communication is such a big part of life anyway, that it's another channel that we need to be comfortable with. And I'm sure they should be doing it at schools for kids and things. And, um, but it's actually, uh, um, it's a rewarding, it's a challenging, but very rewarding thing to do. Great. And I think that is really important to point out. It changes throughout our careers. And so if you're very nervous early on, that probably gets better. Uh, Karen, uh, last tips for us before we close? Yes, we haven't covered clothing. And I think it's very important that you feel confident how you dress. That is yourself. I mean, I, I, look, when you're, when, when you're starting and you speak, you think, how must I look? Must I buy a special outfit? Um, I think that if you you can really see it, if a speaker is dressing up on the occasion and it's not him or her, you can see that people are stiff in their clothes. And I really think you shouldn't you shouldn't 
try to be something you are not. It's better you, you are yourself. And even if it's unconventional, it doesn't matter. Be yourself. Great advice for everything we do. Dan, uh, closing thoughts. Absolutely. Um, so this is maybe more pertinent for earlier learners or people earlier on their progression, but it's say yes. If an opportunity presents itself, say yes. And if you're saying no, you really want to make sure you're saying it because of an actual scheduling conflict or actually something that would prohibit you from taking the opportunity to give the talk. Because your initial, especially if you're early or even, even if you're not, your initial thought is like, no, but you have to make sure you're saying, why, why am I saying no? Is it because I've never done this before and, I, and I'm nervous about it and that's why I'm saying no and I'll make an excuse of why I can't be there? Or is it because you actually shouldn't, you, you know, you, you, you have another obligation, which obviously is fine. But, but it's just so important to just say yes to every opportunity. Every Zoom meeting that I've had in the last year since we've um, launched the show uh, has been just so incredible. Uh, I, you know, Ahmed and I, we preflect and reflect before and after each talk, and we just learn from so many experiences. And we've talked to people there where we ended up having no actionable items, but we learned that, okay, this kind of conversation leads to no actionable items. And so, you know, and then in a, even a talk like this, I, I've been on a few of these before, but the first one, I was initially like, no way, you know, I can't, I, I've never done this before. Just say yes, and you'll make it happen. And you'll add that to your personal repertoire and you're also your CV and you'll grow in confidence and continue to say yes. Great. Well, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand it back to Alex who will find, uh, close us out. Yeah. Um, again, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists. Thank you, our moderator, Allison. Um, thank the video participants, um, all of the mm -hmm. women who took the time throughout the summer to record these videos at all hours of the day and night um, and to give some extremely thoughtful, insightful and helpful um, advice to the Women as One community and the greater cardiology community. Um, uh, just a reminder that the, a recording of this session, as well as the video themselves, will live on the Women as One talent directory. So please uh, go ahead and visit that if you'd like to uh, revisit the discussion or see the video again. And just again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.